Good morning, good morning. God bless you. God bless you. Welcome to Cyber Sunday School from the Pastor Study, the Mount Calvary Community Church, the biggest little church right here in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm Bishop Chambers, and we are deliciously delighted to be in your homes, your automobiles, wherever you're kind enough to tune in. Every week, we give praises and glory to God for all of you. Take a moment right now to like, love, and share this broadcast and let your timeline know that Mount Calvary is on the air. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for these, your people who've assembled in this digital space this morning for the word of the Lord. Let the word go forth to this morning and accomplish where in two it is sent. In Jesus' name, we give you praise and glory. Let every heart say amen and thank the Lord. Grab your Bibles and your notebooks and let's delve into the word of the Lord. This morning, our lesson is justice and the marginalized. Justice and the marginalized. And our proof text is from Deuteronomy chapter 24, uh, 24th chapter, beginning at the 10th verse and a few following verses. God bless you, Sister Thompson. We're so always glad to have you uh, worship the Lord with us. All right, so justice and the marginalized, the aim for change by the end of this lesson we will explore God's standards for justice, appreciate how God loves those who are poor and marginalized and share love with those who are rejected by others. Good morning, Mother Miles. Glad to have you worship the Lord with us. All right, so our in focus story uh, is Melissa couldn't believe her bad luck. She had been laid off three times in the past two years. Every time she was financially stable, her company announced plans to downsize or shut down. That evening, Melissa needed time alone, but then her phone rang. Brandy told me about the cutbacks, her brother Adam said sympathetically. Melissa said that wasn't her news to tell, and you need to mind your own business. <laughs> Adam quickly said, don't shut me out again. God has a purpose. He is your provider, not the company. The Lord always got your back. Melissa hated when her brother got all preachy. His religion was fine for him, but it was not her thing. Adam, my dinner's getting cold. I got to go. Sis, wait, Adam said. I know you, care, you don't care for Jesus, but he gave his church some very specific instructions about to do when people hit hard times. And I want to help. And my church is a program that might be just right for your current situation. I'm not some charity case, Adam, Melissa says. I know, sis, Adam says. Just give this a chance. It can't hurt. Can I come by and talk to you about it tomorrow? Melissa hated that her brother wouldn't take no for an answer. And she hated her situation. But she also hated the feeling so much uh, hate to have hatred at all. Tomorrow then, then she hangs up the phone and tears ran down her face. Um, here's a question. Don't answer this at one time. Hmm? What programs does your church support to help the disenfranchised and the marginalized in your community? What current programs right now are in operation in your local church to help those who are less fortunate? Let's go to the word of the Lord. Again, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 24, beginning with verse 10. And I'm going to read from the God's Word translation this morning. Good morning, Apostle Hopkins. Good morning, Mama. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 10 from God's Word translation reads it like this. When you make a loan to your neighbor, don't go into his house to take a security deposit. Wait outside, and the person to whom you're making the loan will bring the deposit out to you. If the person is poor, don't keep the coat you took as a deposit overnight. Make sure you bring it back to him at sunset. When he wears his coat to bed that night, he'll bless you. You will have done the right thing in the presence of the Lord your God. Verse 14. Don't withhold pay from hired workers who are poor and needy, whether they are Israelites or foreigners living in one of your cities. Pay them each day before sunset because they are poor 
and need their pay. Otherwise, they will complain to the Lord about you and you will be condemned for your sin. Parents must never put to death the, be put to death for the crimes of their children and children must never be put to death for the crimes of their parents. Each person must be put to death for his own crime. Never deprive foreigners and orphans of justice and never take widows' clothes to guarantee a loan. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God freed you from slavery. So I'm commanding you to do this. This is what you must do when you're harvesting wheat in your field. If you forget to bring in one of the bundles of wheat, don't go back to get it. Leave it there for the foreigners. Leave it there for the orphans. Leave it there for the widows. Then the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. When you harvest olives from your trees, never knock down all of them. Leave some for the stranger. Leave some for the orphan. Leave some for the widow. Verse 21. And when you pick up the grapes in your vineyard, don't pick all of them. Leave some for the stranger. Leave some for the orphans. Leave some for the widows. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. I'm commanding you to do this. So far the scripture. Amen. So let's go to the people, places, and times of, of, our, of our lesson. Deuteronomy is one of those uh, most the most significant books in the Old Testament. It is directly quoted over 40 times um, uh, in the New Testament and quoted in Psalms some 68 times. Isaiah quotes Deuteronomy 55 times. And in fact, Jesus himself um, quotes from Deuteronomy each time he was tempted by Satan during his 40 day and 40 night fast. So when a lawyer asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law, the answer Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And then verse 6 goes on. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So it was obvious that Jesus had obeyed the command and hidden the word in his heart. So that he himself would not sin against God. His humanity would not sin against his divinity. So we could do the same thing when we memorize the word, when we meditate upon the law, both day and night, in order to obey it and to be blessed by it. Um, so let's go to the background. In chapter 24 of our lesson, the Israelites are introduced to a set of miscellaneous laws. And it speaks to the understanding of marital commitments for grounds for divorce, remarrying after divorce. Verse five explains why newly married men should be absolved of any military duty uh, for at least one year. The understanding of loans and collateral is interpreted in verse six. If a person borrows anything, he's expected to provide collateral of his choosing as a sign of good faith for the loan, kidnapping to sell someone as a slave was forbidden. That's trafficking. Verse seven, verses eight and nine are not laws, but simply reminders of priestly directives on how to deal with those who have leprosy. So this assortment of laws for the Israelites is presented in, a, in concert with with previous laws framing a clear expectation of how to govern themselves, their understanding, their, their ability, their, their inability um, to appropriately practice laws. Uh, these laws would have been societal and divine consequences. Good morning, uh, Sister Patricia Edwards, first, uh, Chicago. God bless you, Shamisha Parma. 
God bless you. So um, these laws are not directed only to those who were wealthy, but equally uh, important for those who were poor, disenfranchised. So the remaining portion of chapter 24 is fixed on the dignity that should be bestowed upon the disenfranchised, the poor, the stranger, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow. Why do you think there was such an emphasis placed on the dignity of these subgroups, strangers, orphans, widows, the, the poor? Um, so at a glance, we have three three uh, parts to our outline. Uh, one is the debtors, verses 10 through 15 of chapter 24. Then there's the disassociation in verse 16. And we'll conclude verses 17 to 21, dealing with the destitute. So the in-depth uh, verses 10 through 15, this is chapter 24 of Deuteronomy for those who just logged in. God bless you, Roger Taylor. God bless you, T. Smith. So let's deal with the debtors. And it talked about in the beginning, uh, if you make a loan to your neighbor, don't go into his house, but stand outside and wait for him to come out and bring his deposit to you. Don't go in his house looking for collateral on the loan. You know, because if you go in, he brings you a salt and pepper shaker and you be like, well, uh, I like that vase over there better than the, I like your salt and pepper shaker. No, the person that's giving the loan stands outside and just receives his collateral as good faith, whatever is brought out to him or her. But in most cases, it was to him. Um, so the theme of loans and collateral initially sketched in verse 10 resurfaces more succinctly in verse 10. Uh, most often debtors are viewed as being at the disadvantage of the loaner. Although in debt, the debtor should not lose their dignity nor their self-respect. The loaner uh, oppressing the debtor or ignoring the debtor's uh, family needs is outlawed. Do not place your need as the loner above the loanee, the needs of the family of the person you're loaning money to. God cares just as much for the well-being of the debtor as he does the creditor. Each person, regardless of their status, is viewed equally in the sight of God. The loner's job was not to intimidate or humiliate someone because someone owed a debt. As a symbol of good faith, the debtor was to initiate the repayment uh, plan or methods. Conversely, the loner could not dictate what could be used as collateral or payment. Further, he was not permitted to enter into the home of the debtor to demand his preferred method of payment. All right. So if the only thing uh, that the debtor could afford to render were his sleeping clothes, for instance, uh, then that should be deemed as an acceptable form of payment. However, those were to be returned to the debtor by evening so that he could have something to sleep in the next night <laughs> or that, that night. Uh, so uh, um, the same courtesy is given to workers who live hand to mouth. They cannot wait overnight to receive their day's wages. So the employer must not force them to do so. This was all uh, enveloped with the idea of mutual respect. Mutual respect was to be given by both parties, the worker and the employer. The debtor knows he owes the debt and shows his willingness to pay the debt. The creditor recognizes he, he is owed funds, 
but trust the fidelity of the debtor. It creates a loving environment to treat your neighbor as you would want to be treated. So now let's deal with verse 16, where it deals with the, dis the disassociation. Moses reiterates that each person is to be treated individually. This means that there is no generational penalty where the children pay for the crimes of the parent or vice versa. Imposing a uh, punishment, a cumulative punishment will present unjust repercussions and unfair retaliation for offenses not committed by the person receiving the punishment. If this were to be allowed, families or villages could potentially be obliterated because of the offenses of another. So verse 16 seeks to eliminate such retaliatory actions. All right. And then let's go with verses 17 to 21 and it'll conclude our in-depth deep dive. So then Moses continues his dissection of the haves and the have-nots. He goes further on detail on how one must handle the disadvantage. So regardless of your social or economic class, each person must be treated the absolute same. The imagery and remembrance of Israel brings uh, being slaves are brought into focus. In Moses' use of the word slave, he does not want Israel to never forget how they too were disenfranchised in Egypt, how they too were classless in Egypt, how they too were poor in Egypt, and still the Lord chose to redeem them. Now that they were free, now that they are no longer bound by the oppressor, Israel is supposed to see the powerful and the powerless as equal. They are so similar, we should consider the lowly as our neighbors. Taking care of your neighbors is something we should all do, especially the privilege. Gleaning the, uh, the process of sharing with the poor is not only appropriate, but uh, to showcase true love for humanity. Their surplus is to serve as manna from heaven for the needy. Everyone has something to give. That's why I said if you bring in your, your harvest and you, you drop the bushel, don't go back and get it. Leave it there for the stranger. Leave it there for the widow. Leave it there for the orphan. If you're gleaning grapes in your vineyard, leave some. Don't, don't grab all the grapes. Leave some for the stranger. Leave some for the widow. Leave some for the orphan. All right, so let's discuss the meaning. Because it is easy to think that if we have money or if we have status, that we are more important than the next person. In God's eyes, all of us are considered the same and we should all be equal one to another. So how does God seek to deal with our ego and classism? How, how does Jesus' bodily sacrifice coincide with an unredeemable debt? Because truth be told, there is nothing you could ever do to pay for the weight of sin that has been in your life. However, Jesus, by his own doing, gave himself as ransom for the for the pro pre blah, 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 for your sin. <laughs> I can't talk this morning. He gave himself to be the appropriation of your sin. He gave himself wholly to pay the price, to pay the penalty for you right so the urban institute's well-being and basic needs survey found 
that nearly 40% of non-elderly adults report difficulty meeting basic needs such as food, uh, health care, housing, and utilities. And we are one of the wealthiest nations in the world. So why is this, this, this statistic true? God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to our neighbors. Good morning, ministers Anderson and Anderson. It, it is not a matter of the privileged and the underprivileged. It's not a matter of the haves and the have-nots uh, in the sight of God. It, it is never about lauding your privilege, but being generous enough. God bless you, Pat Morris. To share knowing that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Uh, so daily, we've seen people on the streets. We've seen people standing next to the freeways holding up their signs. I need help. I'll work for food. Can you spare something? Often we ignore their concerns or don't think we have enough to help them in their time of need. Yet our help, regardless of the increment, could be the assistance that they need. Many of us have the privilege of going to a home, changing our clothes. Some of us have more than one pair of shoes, and 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 we have we may not have what we want to eat, but we have something to eat. I know you you want lobster, but you got Roman noodles. Enjoy your Roman noodles. Get the shrimp flavored, and imagine you got a lobster there. It won't be the same, but you'll be full. It, it may not be what you want, but it'll, it'll be something. So maybe just think about sharing your, your substance. Could it be that that person might be an angel and God was using them as a means to bless you when you inadvertently have a nature to just give? out of the abundance of your heart, even when you don't have enough to meet your own needs. This week, I want you to look for ways to assist people who are underprivileged, whether providing for their needs or advocating for their rights. This is what the Lord wants you to do this very week. I'm not out of word. We are simply out of time. I want you to stick around for uh, the same station for 11 o'clock worship service here for Mount Calvary Community Church, the biggest little church in Omaha, Nebraska. We'll be preaching from Psalms 27. I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Praise God. So stick around for that. Won't you take a moment right now? I Website is on your screen, www.m3comaha.org, and sow a seed. If you want to write a check or money or to make it payable to Mount Calvary Community Church, 5112 Ames Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska, 68104. Or you can go to our cash app right now, dollar sign M3C5112, dollar sign M3C5112. God bless you. I love you. May heaven smile upon you, be gracious unto you, and we'll see you at 11 o'clock. Until then, we decree and declare that all is well. Accept it in your mind and in your spirit. Just hug somebody and say, He's well with me. Whatever you're going through, whatever you have to face, go knowing that all is well. As you go from this day, from this place, tell yourself that my worst days is behind me. 
and my best days is in front of me. Did you hear what I said? My worst days is behind me. And my best days is in front of me. I dare you to whisper to somebody and declare in your heart and in your mind that my worst days is behind me. And my best days is in front of me. I dare you to say it all over this church. All is well. 